Well, gracious God, your word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. As we open that word now in the context of this community of faith, help us to attend the reading of your word, to hear your truth, and apply it to our lives. We ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading, chapter 4, verses 1, unity, body of Christ. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure, measure of Christ's. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive, who gave gifts to his people. And it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended the lower parts of the Ascended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers who equipped the saints for the work of ministry, building up the body of Christ. Will all of us come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the to the measure of the full stature of Christ? We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, the people's trick, their craftiness, the scheme. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into Him, the head, the Christ, from whom the whole body joins, fit together by every ligament, which it is as each properly notes the body's growth, itself up. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the years, I've had occasion to attend a lot of wedding receptions, and the best man and maid of honor are often asked to give a toast. And in my experience, most of those folks have felt the need to give a little talk before the toast. And some use the occasion to talk about the relationship they have had with the bride or groom. Perhaps they were siblings or college roommates. And some use that moment to impress the crowd with their ability to rhyme. And some, who seem to have no filters, use the moment to shock the crowd in telling us stories that we really did not need to hear. But most everyone who is asked to give one of those speeches at a wedding reception is given time to think about what they're going to say. Well, I'm in a similar position this month. I've known for a long time that this would be my last month in the pulpit here at Oakland, and I have pondered what I wanted to say to you in these five last sermons. You've been an incredibly responsive congregation, listening patiently to what I say, sometimes even acting on things I say, much to my own surprise. So I've decided that I want to share some of the most important things I have learned in 40 plus years of ministry. Some may think that this is a bit self-indulgent and narcissistic, what are you going to do? Fire me? So the things I am going to share reflect both my engagement with the Word of God and uh, my experience in the life of the church, which I can assure you has been overwhelmingly positive. And so in May, we're going to explore five of the more important things I've learned in ministry. Now, I assure you, I have learned more things than these five, but these are the five I've chosen to share with you. And the first one is this. 
Ecumenical work is hard work. Ecumenism refers to the attempt to get Christians from different churches or denominations to work together. Now, to a new believer or an alien from outer space who has no knowledge of human history, this seems like a no-brainer. Why would Christians not work together? Why would it be so difficult for Christians to work together? Don't we all worship the same God? A new believer reading the Bible for the first time might read this wonderful passage that, that Paul wrote in Ephesians, where he tells us that there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. This passage appears to scream that there should be some kind of unity that outsiders could discern, easily discern but nothing could be farther from the truth. There are more Christian denominations in the world than ever before. One source I consulted reports that world Christianity is divided into 300 major church traditions and is composed of over 33,000 distinct denominations in 238 countries. There are also over 3 million worship sites in the world, from major cathedrals in Europe to very humble churches in third world countries. Other experts tell us that there are closer to 40,000 denominations in the world, and whichever number is, is more accurate or closer to reality doesn't matter. It simply makes the point. There is little unity in the body of Christ. And America isn't any better than the rest of the world. R.C. Sproul, in a lecture that he gave in 2010, estimated that there are 2,000 denominations in America. And ironically, every time there is a merger of two denominations, it usually produces three instead of one. Why is ecumenical work so hard? Why is there so little unity when the New Testament seems to suggest that we should exhibit and embrace unity? Well, one reason is uh, that we, we just come from different places culturally. We don't speak the same language. We don't enjoy the same kind of music. Uh, some of us are more reserved, and others are more emotional and expressive. The early church discovered this reality of serious differences uh, within a few years, especially as Paul began to carry the gospel message to the Gentile world, which was primarily Hellenistic in culture and language, built upon the heritage of ancient Greece that was the legacy of Alexander the Great's conquest. The Gentile world in the Roman Empire was very different from the Jewish culture of the first Christians who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus in Jerusalem. Different cultures have different ways of doing things and different ways of understanding the meaning of the gospel. That is very clear from the very start of the church. Another reason for our lack of unity is that people don't magically become perfect when they become Christians. We bring our culture and our biases, our personalities, our flaws, and our foibles with us into the life of the church. The early church wasn't perfect, despite what some people might want you to believe. They fought like cats and dogs over some things. And if you don't believe me, just go back and read the book of Acts, and the letters of the Apostle Paul. And throughout history, ironically, some of the things that should unite us, some of the things you think would unite us, like baptism and the Lord's Supper, are precisely the things that separate us. The fastest way to start an argument with a bunch of clergy from different traditions is to start talking about baptism. So the best way I have of explaining or answering the question why we don't see more unity is to say that the, the unity or the oneness of the church is both a gift and an aspiration. Our own book of order, which is full of just wonderful material, tells us that the unity is God's gift to the church of, in Jesus Christ. Just as God is one God and Jesus Christ is our one Savior, the church is one because it belongs to the one Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say that because in Christ the church is one, it strives to be one. 
To be one with Christ is to be joined with all those whom Christ calls into relationship with him. Division into different denominations obscures, but does not destroy unity in Christ. Unity of the church. The oneness is both a gift and an aspiration. And so Presbyterians have always been interested in helping the visible or institutional church approximate that unity found in the invisible church or the goal that's lifted up in the New Testament. When it happens, it is something beautiful to behold. Some of my favorite uh, memories of ministry include times when the church sought to embrace and reflect more unity. In my first church, I served in, uh, I had the most wonderful ecumenical experience. We had five churches in this tiny town of 300 people, and all five churches did things together. There was a a Roman Catholic church served by a a part-time priest. There was a Lutheran church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian, and a Pentecostal. The pastors and their spouses, those who had wives, met for some social events. We were all about the same age, and so I think that helped. And we genuinely enjoyed each other's company. The clergy organized special services for Lent and Easter that witnessed to our unity in Christ, and we accepted our differences in theology and and practice. For example, the Pentecostal church was very conservative in its view of women. Uh, Women weren't allowed to um, uh, wear dresses, and they weren't allowed to cut their hair. Most of the women wore their hair in in a bun. And they, of course, uh, had to let their husbands take the lead in in most things. And we didn't judge each other because of those differences. One year, we, we got together at the Pentecostal church for an evening service, a Lenten service, and we were all standing and singing. And one of the members elbowed my wife, Pat, and pointed to our son, who was, was probably three years old at the time. And he was standing on the pew so he could see in front of him, and he was waving his hand back and forth, just like Pentecostal people were doing. And we didn't tell our son not to do that. But everyone knows Presbyterians don't worship that way. We are more reserved, to say the least, And with good reason, some people have referred to us as God's frozen chosen. That part of my my ministry was just so wonderful in terms of ecumenism. When we moved to Pennsylvania, I joined the local ministerial association and expected to have the same kind of experience. Something similar, however, I was disappointed. Partly because there were There was a history of some of the churches not working together with each other, and there were some personalities that didn't work together well. One Methodist pastor, for example, came to his church out of a a college experience where he'd been a chaplain. And as a chaplain, he had been working with students from all different Christian backgrounds, and he even served on uh, a national, international ecumenical committee for the Methodist church. And he could not abide the Baptist minister. And I thought it was ironic that he would travel across the Atlantic Ocean to have a meeting on church unity, but he wouldn't cross the bridge in our town to go to a meeting with the Baptist preacher. It was becoming clear to me, contrary to my first few years of ministry, that ecumenical work is really hard. But it has always been a part of our Presbyterian DNA to reach out and make the effort to work together and witness to our unity in Christ. And it can be, it can be rewarding. And sometimes the most rewarding experiences come in the local churches. In the community that I served in Pennsylvania, though we had some failures, we also had some significant successes. And one of those was something called the Unity Cross. At the suggestion of one of our Roman Catholic priest, someone made a, a rough cross out of, out of tree branches, and starting in January, congregations would take that cross from one church to another. This was an idea that, uh, the idea was that pastors would get in touch with each other to arrange for the transfer of that cross. And ideally, the church that had the cross would walk it to a nearby church after the wor- their worship, 
and then there'd be some kind of brief service of welcome involving the receiving church and those that had come from the church that had brought the cross. It sounds so nice, doesn't it? And it was an idea that our people really, the people in the community just absolutely loved. But there were some problems with the logistics of moving the cross. The biggest problem was the fact that churches worship at different times. And very few pastors were willing to alter the times of their worship to accommodate the moving of the cross. And so I'd call one pastor or another to make these arrangements, and I'd say, well, we can bring it at 1145. And they say, oh, no, that's not going to work. You know, can you bring it at 1230? Oh, no, I said, that's not going to work for us. And can you shorten your service? No, no. Can you lengthen your service? Oh, no, no. It, on and on, this, these conversations would, would go on. And I dreaded making arrangements to move the cross. It was an enormous hassle, enormous hassle for me. And I can hear you say, oh, poor Pastor Bob. But every year when we welcomed the cross from one of the congregations in town, when they would parade it to the front of our chancel as we sang the old rugged cross for the Baptist and Pentecostal churches or lift high the cross for the Catholic and Lutheran churches, I would watch my people and tears would come down their, uh, their cheeks. And I would think to myself, this was worth the trouble. This was worth the trouble. Some ecumenical and endeavors are worth the effort. Now, when we moved to Oakland, I became involved in uh, something that happened uh, about mid-ministry here, the Oakland Coalition of Churches. And I have to give a lot of credit to Liz Clark from our church, who really chaired that, that effort for several years and really didn't get much credit for it. She did an, an amazing job, and we did some good things. But we learned, once again, that ecumenical work is challenging. Some people wanted to do things that we just couldn't do. Some folks on the coalition thought that if they voted to do something, that group of six or eight people, then all the other churches would just immediately step up and enthusiastically endorse everything the coalition voted to do, even if it was not grounded in reality. When I spoke to one of the men who was a representative from one of the churches in town about a project, about taking the project back to his church for approval, he told me, oh, I'm not a member of the church. The pastor just asked me to come and represent the church at the meeting. This man had virtually no influence in the congregation he was trying to represent. Now, this was not his fault, but it, it just went to show how much that church was invested in the coalition. Not much at all. I had to get involved on in several occasions and remind people that we make decisions in different ways, and Presbyterians do things decently and in order, and we're all about process. We take our time. Others wanted to roll up their sleeves and get to work, and they had no patience for churches that were more interested in process. And the coalition came to an end, sadly, when the folks involved just kind of threw up their hands and concluded that this is too hard, and it did not produce enough fruit to keep it going. They, they reinvested in other activities, and I'm sorry to see the coalition die, but some good things came from it. For me personally, I got to know people from the community and from different churches that otherwise I would not have been able to get to know. So it enriched my Christian walk. You know, no one in seminary told me that ecumenical work was going to be so hard. I suppose I should have known from studying history because there have been times in history when Christians have killed each other for some belief that they held dearly. I firmly believe that our denominational differences will not matter when we get to heaven. The things we argued about in this life that have been so precious to us probably won't even be a part of the conversation in heaven. As the hymn writer put it, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Our unity or our oneness is a gift those of us who are in Christ, and also an aspiration for the organizational church. And Presbyterians have always heard that calling more so than some others. It's, it's part of our heritage. It's, it's who we are. I want to close with telling you one story, another story. One of the highlights of my career came when I was, when I was a commissioner to the 209th General Assembly 
of our church that met in Syracuse in 1997. And I was asked to serve as the vice moderator of a committee on ecumenical relations. And one of the issues before us was something called the formula of agreement between our denomination and three other Protestant denominations. And one of the important things that came out of that agreement was the decision that though we still do not agree on what happens in the Lord's Supper, in particular, how Christ is present in the sacrament, we were not going to let those differences keep us from celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And many people don't realize it, but this, this agreement overcame 400 years of separation. This was a huge step. So when I came back to... Uh, when I came back home to Elwood City, I, I immediately called uh, the other Presbyterian churches or pastors in town and the two Lutheran pastors, and I proposed that we have a joint service to celebrate this new reality, that we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, because now we could do so. Most agreed that this was a good idea, but we had to iron out some details. Location was relatively easy. We met at the Lutheran church. I offered to, to preach, so they were okay with that. The biggest issue had to do with the way communion would be served. Lutherans in that community used real wine. Presbyterians used grape juice. Lutherans came forward and used a common cup. Presbyterians used the little cups and served people in their pews, you know, the way Jesus did at the Last Supper. And after a lot of discussion, we decided uh, on a compromise. We would invite people to come forward and receive the elements, like the Lutherans did, to honor their tradition. And we would use the individual cups to honor the Presbyterian way of doing things. On one side of the chancel, there was grape juice, on, and on the other side was real wine, and so people had a choice. I noted with great interest that most of my people got in line for the wine. They wouldn't dare suggest that we use real wine in our church, but they were happy to take it when we were together with the Lutherans. And you know, maybe, maybe it was their way of saying, we may not agree on everything, but in our book, bottom line, you're okay. One of the things I've learned in ministry is that ec ecumenical work is hard work. But when we get a, a small success, it's like a, a foretaste of heaven. And that's why we keep trying. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunity you give us in life to celebrate and practice and witness to our unity in Christ. We know, Lord, that we haven't always done well. We haven't always succeeded. Forgive us for that and help us, help us to do better. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.